about that guy calls himself James MK. Oh yeah. That motherfucker smokes two packs a day. I heard he's got his own show now. Oh yeah? Yeah, it's growing real fast. And now everybody's gonna be That guy calls himself James M.K. And that Doc Natus, he know how to play. Uh, okay, guys, uh, welcome to the 30th episode of the On Blast show. Uh, James M.K., Doc Natus. Um, tonight we're going to be joined by Stryker from uh, the Mortal Kombat Legacy 2 episodes. Um, Quick uh, shout outs I want to get out there. Uh, down in Argentina, uh, there was a tournament uh, for Ultimate MK, and it was uh, done by uh, the guys down in uh, Argentina. And I'm going to give you the results. Um, OBS, uh, I can't even pronounce it all, Mariano Tekken took uh, fourth place. Um, you had Emperado, who took number one. Destructor Anal K, who took number two. Billy1989 and Mariano Tekken, who's an OBS member, took uh, took uh, fourth place. Um, just showing everybody that uh, UMK is alive and well all over the world. Um, and pretty much that, uh, you know, like I said, uh, MK is here to stay. It'll be here for a while. <coughs> also, uh... Down in uh, Trinidad, they had uh, MK9 tournament, and uh, the top three take take bus face. Then you had Panda, who's a Sonya Cyber sub, and Shang player took second place. What's up, Toxic? Um, and then Lion, Johnny Cage, and Reptile, and the rest of the guys. I'm supposed I'm waiting for it, but uh, that's by uh, OBS Phoenix. Who's a uh, OBS member down in uh, Trinidad? Uh, Vincent Gayadine. Uh, appreciate uh, the heads up on that. Um, also, uh, want to let everybody know that uh, the Crazy 88 is uh, doing a donation drive to get everybody down to Evo, or should I say, as many of the players as they can. Um, you know, pretty much, uh, if anybody wants to uh, to donate, reach out to uh, Napalm88 and, uh, you know, help get as many people for the 88s to Evo this year. Um, if they can't get to Evo, get their ashes to VXG, because that's where I'll be. Um, they already had, yeah, they already, uh, apparently they've already had one person, uh, I can't remember the name of them, it wasn't a... Emperor, it was a, uh, I cannot remember the, the clan, but somebody from another clan actually donated 250 bucks right off the bat, 
which was kind of cool, especially being that it was a rival clan. Um, like I said, I don't know who exactly it was, and I'm sorry for that because I'm kind of all over the place right now. Um, also, a uh, big shout-out to uh, EGP Tyrant for uh, taking SDR this weekend um, with Jax, proving once again that Jax is a force to be reckoned with in the right hands. And, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, I believe, Wound Cowboy was second, right? Yes. You know, Wound Cowboy, uh, online, offline player. Uh, proven once again that online players can be uh, viable foes in the offline world. Um, third place was who took third? Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember either. If nobody cares about third and on. Um, the Chris G uh, 16-bit match turned out to be kind of a massacre. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit, and then I'm going to reach out to our guest. Uh, what's up, guys? Um, not much in here. I'm not kind of surprised at these numbers here, guys. Got to bump these up. Guys, make sure you, whoever's in here, make sure you follow the stream. Uh, we only got 384 followers so far. We should have had more, but we're 87,000 views. So, guys, make sure you follow the stream. Uh, follow us on YouTube. Uh, links are on the bottom. Twitter, Facebook, all that shit. So you know when the show goes live. Uh, Shouts out to all the websites. I don't feel like going through all of them today. Um, trip sessions. Yeah, trip sessions. Shout out to trip sessions. And like I said, everybody else is down on the bottom. Look at the info section. It's there, guys. If, if you can't see it for some damn reason, I don't know why, but the info section has everybody on there. It's you know supports us and stuff like that. Um, uh, a little bit of news going on in the MK world. Uh, James MK got his bracelet off. Yeah, Mr. James MK finally got his bracelet off. It's about time. We, we got a happy man over here. Um, we got uh, Injustice comic that came out. Volume 2 is now available. Uh, it's a digital comic, I believe it is. Uh, I haven't looked at it. I haven't looked at the first one either, so I have no idea. Uh, let's see. Mr. Boone teases something huge coming out tomorrow on Thursday. So I guess uh, another character release possibly coming out. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, also possibility of the Blue Beetle, which I don't even know who the hell that is in the DC world. Apparently, he's, Blue... a, apparently he's a good dude. Uh, is he? I, I, I have no freaking idea who the hell Blue Beetle is, but apparently Blue Beetle is going to be showing up. Well, possibly showing up. Which is, I guess, in a way, a good thing because it's not any, it's not another character from the Batman series. So, I, I, I'll, I'll be happy about that. Um, also, uh, what else was going on? Oh, the new fan made video, uh, more to come at Downfall, which was a live action film, which is a short film, but it was actually pretty entertaining. Uh, they did a lot of special cool effects in it, and uh, I kind of wish the fight scenes was a little longer than that, but it was actually pretty cool, guys. You guys, you guys need to really check that out. Um, what else was going on in the world? What's up, Red Rum? What's up, Gro? Yeah, definitely shouts up to Tyrant for winning uh, uh, SoCal Regionals. Uh, it was pretty hyped up finals with him and Wound Cowboy. So definitely shouts out to him. And guys, remember definitely he he will be on the show later on after we get Striker on. Um. And other news. What's up, Mr. Molina? Uh, da, 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 I, was trying, I had a list of news stuff going on. Oh, uh, apparently they got a, the the pre-order for the Red Sun stuff for Injustice coming out. I know a lot of people are getting hyped up about Injustice, so definitely, uh, you know, that's something to check out. Remember, this, they got the stick coming out and everything, so they got that limited edition. It's like 150 for the limited edition. So we'll take it from there and see what happens to the limited edition when it comes out. Um, other than that, I mean, that's pretty much on the news end for you guys. Um, I'll let James carry it over right now. Go ahead. All right. Well, for starters, guys, this bud's for you all. I thought you weren't going to drink. <laughs> I lied. I'm, gonna have, I'm, allowed, I'm entitled to a beer. 
Uh, I'm going to get right to it, guys. Um, you know, like I said, uh, you know, uh, shout out to everybody that showed up uh, a little week today. What's up, Mr. Revolver? Uh, we got Red Rum, we got Guido, we got Costner. You know, we got the guys that are usually the usual uh, consistent followers Grow, Mr. Molina. Uh, yeah, guys, please retweet also. Let people know the show's on. I, yeah, I get this the link out, out there. there. Get it out there. 48 viewers is not good compared to having 250, to, you know, two weeks ago. Um, the numbers will go up as the night goes on. So, um, anyway, let me reach out right now to Eric and get him in here. You dirty son of a bitch. Uh, da, 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 da. And where am I? Where am I? Where am I? There we go. Okay. Thank you guys for the retweets. Yeah. yeah. There you go. How you doing, Eric? Look at that technology. I'm good. How are you? So uh, we're doing good, uh, everybody. This is uh, Eric Jacobus. Is that the proper pronunciation? Jacobus. Jacobus. A little too much emphasis. Everyone gets it. <laughs> um, he is striker from the Legacy Two series. Um, and we're going to get right into a uh, quick Q&A. Um, we're going to start with, uh, tell us a little bit about you as far as, uh, you know, how did you uh, wind up getting the part? Uh, and, uh, you know, is it something that uh, you were familiar with going into it? Or was it something you had to pick up as you went along? I was, um, yeah, I've been making independent films for a while, action films, martial art films. And I know Larnell from a few years ago, uh, the choreographer. And it looks like, you know, they, they had a part that fit me. You know, they had the striker part. And I think that I'm known, the movies that I make, I tend to play a character that's kind of an underdog, uh, the human character. And that's exactly what striker is. And that character is available. And uh, Larnell pushed for me. And uh, yeah, I owe him a lot for that. And also Clayton. And uh, Kim Doe and the stunt guys that were involved. Um, thanks, guys. It was awesome. Now, uh, you uh, you grew up uh, where? California guy, New York guy, South guy? I'm from Redding, California, Northern California. Small uh, town. Arcade-wise, um, I mean, are you... Uh, are you a gamer, or, or was this, like I said, was this a role that, like, you were unfamiliar with that you had to kind of, you know, uh, do the research and get into it, or were you already familiar with Jack? I mean, with Jack, with Striker. Yeah, I, I grew up in the arcade, and I was I was fully cognizant when Mortal Kombat One came out, and I remember uh, asking my mom, I was like, Mom, will you uh, will you guys get me in a Mortal Kombat One arcade cabinet for Christmas? And you know, it's not just you and Dad that have to buy it. Like, all of the family, everybody who buys me a gift can pitch in like a hundred bucks and get this arcade cabinet for me. Like I was so wild about that game. And, uh, and I loved it because it had human characters in it, you know? And so I grew up in the arcades. Like that place was my home. Um, you know, I was an only child. I would spend my Fridays there and I would bring, you know, 20 bucks and quarters and I'd just blow them all away on Friday afternoon. And so, um, I was fully aware of Mortal Kombat. That's for sure. And, I always like the striker character because he is like the human. You know, him and Johnny Cage are kind of like the guys that are you know, the uh, the underdogs, I guess. Because everybody else is, you know, has these crazy special moves, and I guess kind of Johnny Cage has a couple special moves. But Striker is just kind of like, you know, he's kind of out in the woods. Uh, the guy's got a baton and a, and a grenade, you know, and they even kind of played him up that way in Mortal Kombat Three when uh, he just kind of looks like Jeff Daniels from from Speed. <laughs> you know, t-shirt and a ton but yeah uh, when they told me about that i was like yeah that's me that's totally the character i want to play now uh you said you were uh, arcade generation so you hung out i guess in the arcades yeah there was a there was an arcade in Reading called the gold mine and you know it had it had deluxe games it had old games and it had the new releases too and when Mortal Kombat when UMK3 came out they had um they had like the two screens up so that people could compete and 
everybody would crowd around the machines. And I mean, that was like, that was like culture as a kid. I love that place. And I, I would play, I played all the fighting games too. I mean, I was a big Sega fan as a kid, but uh, Mortal Kombat really, that was kind of like the go-to game for everybody. That was always the one that was out front. Were you, uh, were you competitive? I mean, were you uh, uh, a decent player or were you that guy that everybody did friendships to? Uh, yeah, I was that guy. I sucked, man. I mean, I'd, get, I'd always get killed by kids. And because I, I never knew the moves, too, when the game came out, it was like somehow, you know, we're talking about the early 90s here. And back then, there was no internet. So you had to figure out how to get your move list. And I was always baffled because I, here I am, this like 10 year old kid wandering into the arcade to spend my 20 bucks and quarters. And like some other guy would come up and I'd be playing Mortal Kombat 3 trying to figure out how to do special moves. And I knew maybe one or two because they were listed up on the, on the cabinet itself. But then like some guy would come up with just a crumpled up piece of binder paper and he would have like all the moves on it somehow. And I was like, how the hell did that guy find that? And like those guys just had the right information, you know, and they were the ones that kicked everybody's asses in the arcade, and I was the one that got my ass kicked all the time. Um, you know, besides Mortal Kombat, what were some of the other games that you were uh, big into? <clears throat> wow, I, I, um, I was, like I said, I was a Sega fan. All of the Sega Deluxe games were really good, I thought. Like, they had the uh, um, Wing Arms, they had uh, uh, Sega Rally, which I loved. I played that all the time. Um, and I bought a Saturn when it came out because all these games came out on Saturn. Um, I was big into Virtual Fighter from Virtual Fighter 2 onward. You know, that's when they really, that's when they kind of fixed the floating issues, and the first one was kind of slow. But when Tekken came out, I think like that that kind of changed everybody's perception of how 3D fighters should be. And, uh, and I got really into Tekken for a while. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, um, but in terms of fighting games, yeah, like UMK3 was my favorite one. And then, like, some of the other ones, like, when I was a kid, I, I discovered Tron, the video game, like, at Chuck E. Cheese, and that got me into the movie, you know, rather than the movie getting me into the game. And then, and then lastly, like, the games that really blew my mind was when we started getting the Laserdisc arcade games. And those were, like, you know, Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair and stuff, yes, those were great. Yeah, and, the, and, like, you know, there would always be that kid that would just know every move, and you'd just play the 30-minute video of Dragon Slayer, and, and everyone would just kind of stand around him watching, because we didn't understand as kids that this was just a video. We thought that this was a video, like, we thought that he was controlling how things moved on the screen. It was really, you know, fascinating. That's why later this was so cool. But the one that I really loved was Cliffhanger, which was um, Lupin the Third, apparently. Like, they took Lupin the Third, and they put it on a laser disc and made it into an arcade game called Cliffhanger. Yep, I remember it well. Yeah, nobody knew what the hell it was, and I remember that was the first anime I ever I say, here I am, a seven-year-old kid at Chuck E. Cheese, and then anime comes up on this arcade machine, and it just blew my mind. And then, you know, fast forward 20 years later, 15 years later, and I'm watching some anime at a friend's house, and there it is, Lupin the Third. And I was like, oh, that was a video game. I remember playing that part. Do you know that they actually turned those into iPhone apps now? Yeah, I can believe it. I mean, you know, I remember, because I remember I used to ask the arcade guy, like, how much does this cost? You know, twenty grand, and now it's a ninety-nine cent app. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And I, I actually came across a uh, a uh, cliffhanger laser disc, and I, I'm a collector of laser discs now. I'm a real nerd like that, and uh, so I'm going to try and build an arcade cabinet for for cliffhanger. Now we'll see. Well, you know what? Before the show's over, you know, or, or before we're all done, I got a guy that used to work for Leland that actually manufactured the cabinets. That, uh, and, he, and he still probably has some of the working hardware still laying around, which is a good thing to have. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, martial arts, what uh, what are you trained in? I started out in Taekwondo. I was a late bloomer. Uh, up in Reading, I, I just didn't do a whole lot. I did a little bit of karate when I was a kid, but it wasn't really until I started making movies that I realized that I wanted to do martial arts and you know show an authentic uh, display of martial arts. Before that, I was doing gymnastics and stuff. I was a pretty acrobatic kid, and I was weightlifting, and I was strong, but uh, I had the foundation necessary to go into martial arts late, and I started Taekwondo when I was 20, uh, when I moved to San Francisco for film school, and um, I did that for two years or so, and then I got into Hapkido, and I've been doing Hapkido ever since, so Hapkido for about eight, nine years now, and I do a, um, I do a style of Hapkido that's created by um, Young Jae Nam, 
And uh, he created the system called Han Keto, which is very, it's very circular. It's almost kind of like he mixes Hop Keto with Korean dance, and it's uh, it's deadly, you know, like like all martial arts. But um, but it's got its own unique flavor. And and Hap Keto, I should note too, it, it's not just throws. It's not it's not just Korean Aikido. This is like this is like a quarter throws, a quarter kicks, quarter punches, and a quarter grapple. So we do everything. A little of everything. Cool. Yeah. Um. What uh, so? What was your experience like working with uh, with Kevin? It was it, my, the first. The fr I didn't meet Kevin until I don't know my third rehearsal or something like that. Um, and then it was obvious that the guy knows the he knows the material, you know. And that's that's something that's totally missing from directors these days because you get so many guys going in to make video game movies and they just never played the game. <laughs> they, like. They got the contract, they're like, oh yeah, I'll direct it. And then they watch videos of the game and then they think that they can throw a movie together with it and it sucks every time. Uh, Kevin obviously has played the game. He's passionate about it. I mean, that's why when he did the original uh, uh, Mortal Kombat Rebirth, was it? The yes. original, or yeah. I mean, he, he, took it, he took it in a new direction that the fans love because he understands the characters. Um, and he's like the fan's dream come true. Um, like there's nobody that could do Mortal Kombat better than that guy, you know. Yeah, um, I definitely. I mean, I can't see uh, Warner Brothers going with somebody else for the third movie. To be honest with you. And, I hope. Well, didn't he say already? <clears throat> didn't he say already he was doing the third movie? Did he? He said he yeah. Was doing the third movie. Yeah, he's, he's directing the third movie. Right. So, so you know the good thing about that, I would think, is you know he can uh, he can tap into the cast from this to keep the uh, the continuity with the the legacies, hopefully, to the movie. I would love that. So I mean, we need we need to have a striker. We can't, like I said, we can't go back to the donut eating striker. No, no, not until I'm older. <laughs> um. For you, what uh, what got you into the whole acting thing? Was it the, was it the acting side? Was it the stunt thing? I mean, I said I heard you say you went to film school. It was um, it was really just a passion to do martial art movies because I was really into Jackie Chan and Jet Li and um, Bruce Lee kind of, but Jackie Chan is like Jackie Chan is my Bruce Lee and and Samuel Hung too. For those who know that, because he's kind of like Jackie's older big brother. And I was uh, I was really into '80s Hong Kong action films, and I once they kind of petered off in the early '90s, um, and I had just gotten into it, and so I realized that nothing new was coming out uh, out of Hong Kong because there was kind of that dead spot in between, like '95 and 2000, uh, right during the handover. And uh, I wanted to I I had, I had no idea how I would make a Jackie Chan movie. Like I was watching uh, Drunken Master Two, which is his best, I think. And, uh, and and that was like the third Jackie Chan movie I watched, and you know it's kind of like it's kind of like experimenting with drugs and just taking the most hardcore drug right away. You kind of realize like, oh, it doesn't get any better than this. Like it didn't get any better than that. And and I was trying to think of like how how can I leave my mark? Um, is it possible for someone like me from a small town to do a movie like this? And I got some guys together and tried it out, you know. And 12 years later, here I am. And that got me. I mean, we started making movies before I knew martial arts, before I could act, and before I had gone to film school. Like, all that was secondary and tertiary. And it was like the first thing was the passion of just making the movie. We just wanted to do something cool. What, uh, what was your first movie? My first movie was some awful short that we did at our convention center. But, you know, like we did in our first year, I mean, we did like three hours worth of shorts. So we'd shoot every weekend. We were just nuts about it. Um, the first major one that we did was uh, was a, a feature film called Immortal, which is now online for free. It's easy to find on our YouTube channel. And um, and then we did another feature film called Contour, and that was one that I hailed. And, uh, you know, I raised $5,000 to make a low-budget martial arts movie that was just jam-packed with fights. I wanted to do like I mean like I wrote the script. The script was forty pages for a feature length film, which, you know, if you consider that there's one page per minute when you make a film, it's like 
any studio exec would have looked at my script and said that's a 40 minute movie but no actually what i would have is like one line in the script that said fight scene and like that fight would be four minutes of the movie <laughs> um, so it was loaded with those fights and we just spent a year making this movie i mean we were college kids we had time um, some of us had just graduated. We were kind of like figuring out what we wanted to do with our lives. Nobody was married. Nobody had kids. And so we just like hung out in a warehouse for 60 days and made a fight, uh, made, a, made an action movie. And that kind of put us on the map. I mean, now that movie's on Netflix, you know? Um, I'm actually, I'm looking at your, uh, your arsenal of movies. Um, Dogs of Chinatown. That actually rings a bell to me. Does it? That's kind of a lesser known movie I did in North Carolina uh, in 2007. I was hired as the lead actor by um, by these guys, the Beatdown Boogie guys. They do, uh, shoot, they do Metal War Gear Solid now. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's those guys. Oh, okay. Same crew. Okay. Hey, uh, Nadis, you got some questions? <clears throat> I know yes, I, I do. I saw so hundreds of them floating, so. I'll let you take over for a little bit. I'm gonna go feed these ones. All right. Uh, hold on. Let me scroll down to it. All right. Ready. So I gotta go back because people started sending the questions since like yesterday. We'll get to them. Uh, uh, oh, I know sh this person asked a question. Hold on. I I'm actually going back two days. <laughs> two days. Yeah, right, two while days. You're looking, while questions. you're looking, while you're looking, let me, uh, I, you know, and I asked you this when we talked, Cobra Kai or the Karate Kid. I've asked every every martial arts guy who who is who were you rooting for? Karate Kid. And eh, Ralph Macchio. I know, I know, I'm rooting for him. I mean, he's the underdog. You know, that's 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 really uh, that's the guy I always go for. Not everybody. I understand that, but that's my that's my shtick. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with it. Ain't everybody different strokes, different folks. I just like to sweep the leg. I actually seen there was a band that did a uh, a music video, and they actually brought both of them back. And the actual name of the song is "Sweep the Leg." <laughs> And they actually, and they actually brought Ralph Macchio, and I don't know what the actor's name is that played Johnny. Um, oh yeah. And they wound up bringing him back to, uh, and they, in, you know, in their older age, and they spoofed on him. Um, it was actually pretty funny. Um, huh. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. How old is Ralph, Ralph Macchio? Right he's got. Uh, he's got to be in in the in the original, or you mean now? No, the new one. Now he's <laughs> about he's about uh, forty. Oh, you know, so he's yeah he's, he's he's up there. Like I said, I, I I think I mentioned to you, he actually grew up <clears> in the <throat> town that I live in. Oh yeah, he did. Um, all right. So now now that we talked to Ralph Macchio, who would you consider your favorite actor? My favorite actor, I think the guy that I, the guy that I like the most is uh, Pete Takeshi. I'm a big beat Takeshi fan, or Takeshi Kitano, as he's known as a director when he does directing. The beat Takeshi was the guy that did uh, Brother and Kikujiro and uh, Fireworks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, very minimalist, and uh, not very. You know, it's, it's it's kind of it's kind of ironic. Like the guy is very not actiony, you know, but he's kind of an action hero that wins fights with one move. It's a good way to make fight. I mean, that's cl kind of closer to the realism of fighting of martial arts in general. Usually, it's a one move and it's over. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're always struggling with that. Like, how do we keep this fight going on for three minutes realistically? <laughs> Favorite actress. Favorite actress. I go with. Uh... Ooh, do I have one? <laughs> Who's an actress? Um, I like. Uh, I mean, I'll just go with action. I mean, I'm. I keep on. I keep on going back to Hong Kong, but Moon Lee was my favorite because Moon Lee was like the female action guy. <laughs> like she could fight like a dude, and it was so cool. 
But then after her, I would say Cynthia Rothrock as a as like a martial arts actress. She was badass, and she's like one of the only white women that, or even foreigners in general, to go over to Hong Kong and star in a film. Like that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't take that from somebody. That's amazing. Is she doing anything anymore? I don't even know. She keeps doing stuff. Does she? She's, yeah, she's she's trying to do a. Last I saw her, she was talking about doing a collaboration with like Don Wilson and Richard Norton, trying to get like kind of an Expendables type film. But like for those guys, like, okay. That was the last I heard. Natus, you got you got those questions? Yeah, I'm Look, ready now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this. I gotta take a message to see. Okay, I'm ready. Um, question from Katana fan page. Um, were you involved in any of the scenes with Samantha Joe and Michelle Lee? If so, how was it to work with them? I never got to work with them. I was not in any of their scenes, unfortunately. Oh, I that sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, they were really cool. I mean, I, I ate lunch with them, you know, every day, you know. Um, and I got to work out with them a little bit when we were doing rehearsals. Uh, they're both extremely talented. Uh, there aren't many, there aren't many women that can pull off that kind of fighting um, in Hollywood, you know, like, at, and and act at the same time. Like that's the virtue of it is that they're acting too, and that's that's cool uh, when you can have both. And there aren't many women that can do that. That can like that, you know, women that look like women that are you know pretty and can act and then can pull off a good fight scene. You got to get like, and having two of them <laughs> in the show, like that's amazing. All right, they're awesome. Um, I wish I could have worked with them. Um, we'll find a way. All right. Uh, next question. Question from Striker Combat: Which other MK Legacy castmate did you enjoy working with the most? I have to say, I enjoyed working with Casper the most. Um, Casper Van Dien, who plays Johnny Cage. Okay. And. And it's be, and you know I didn't really work too closely with many other cast members. I mean I was always there on set with them, but they were usually doing different scenes. Um, Casper, Casper is so cool. Mind my cat. Um, Casper is so cool because he's uh, he's totally fitting the Johnny Cage role because you know this is a guy that did Starship Troopers and he hasn't done like a big blockbuster action film since Starship Troopers, and it like fits his character as Johnny Cage. And he kept on making, he was the guy that would always keep things lighthearted, you know, like when people were getting serious and when, when the actors, when we were sitting there in the cold and the rain and it's like, you know, 10 p.m. and we're trying to do this dialogue scene and we're just sitting at the beach, he just starts cracking jokes. And that's Casper. Uh, he was a blast. Um, everybody on the crew was really cool anyway, but like Casper just kept it light. And um, and then the other guy, the guy I worked with, I guess secondarily would be Brian T, who plays uh, Luke Kang, and that guy just gave it all. Um, like there's there's just a part where he's he got to play this kind of crazy, crazy iteration of Luke Kang, and he kept on like leaning his head down and hyperventilating in order to get into the character. It was it was a trip, and really inspirational for all of us actors seeing that. Um, these guys know their stuff, you know. These are professionals. All right. Um, next question uh, from Striker Combat again. Uh, did you get to show off any of your martial arts moves in Legacy without revealing anything about it? Hmm. I get to show off a little bit, yes. Okay. Show off a little bit of half keto, and uh, that's about all I can say. All right. And it's uh, fast. I'm a fast. <laughs> <move> fast. <laughs> uh, from the same person again. Um, would you return to play Striker again if asked? In a heartbeat. I would, uh, drop I would drop everything I'm doing right now and do it. <laughs> um, same person again. What other projects have you got lined up for 2013? We are lining up a slate of shorts for our YouTube channel, our Stunt People YouTube channel. We're going to do a, uh, a few fun how-to videos, which should be really interesting. And, uh, and I'm... Um, I'm working on a feature right now called Marine Corps M-A-R-I-N-E-C-O-R-E and that will be that will be our feature film for 2013 um, it'll be loaded with fights it's kind of like it's kind of like Rambo meets Ninja Scroll 
um, that's kind of the way I've been pitching it, you know, like it's out in the woods and it's kind of Rambo characters and there are these six assassins that are hunting him and it's kind of like a surviving the game type story. It'll, it'll be awesome. Um, the scripts, we're almost done with the script right now. It's being written by Steve Carolan. Uh, Rebecca Ahn is producing it and um, it's going to be cool and keep an eye out for it. All right. Um, next question. Uh, same person again. Uh, Striker. Striker is my favorite MK fighter. Who is your, who's yours from Mortal Kombat 9? I have to admit, I've played Mortal Kombat 9 only a few times. Um, but the times that I did, I felt like Sub-Zero was my go-to guy. Now, they did at least ramp up Striker, which I appreciate. But um, you, I, I couldn't really, like, I couldn't get into the character. He's kind of like, he kind of reminded me of Akira in uh, Virtual Fighter. He was just... It was hard for me to get the hang of him. Um, but I went for uh, Sub-Zero. I betrayed my character, I have to admit. All right. From Insider2000, what value do, do you personally find in a character like Striker among the cast of Mortal Kombat? I love Striker because he's the human. You know, he's transported to, this, to like the nether realm. And he doesn't have any fireballs. He's got nothing. All he has is a gun, and that gun, as you know from the game, doesn't do jack. You can't just put a bullet in someone's head and win. Like, um, there's something about that character that, that it's kind of pathetic, and I like that kind of character the most. I feel like I can draw emotions for that kind of character better than I can for, say, a badass character like any of the others, like Sub-Zero, uh, Liu Kang, or Raiden. Yeah, I, I like being able to pull the vulnerability out um, and win by intelligence, win with tactics rather than a big move of some kind. That's always kind of been my angle. And again, this is why it's such a perfect part for me. And again, thank you, Larnell and Kim and Clayton for like recommending me for that. All right. Um, next question from Agent Sambora. What was it like working with the cast of MK Legacy, and who was your favorite to work with? Um, well, like I, I said earlier, Casper was probably my favorite to work with. Um, but I will also add that Mark Dacascos is a, uh, a, a childhood idol of mine who plays Kung Lao in the, in the, in the series. And there's no better Kung Lao, I'm telling you, than, than Mark Dacascos. He shaved his head for the part, which he didn't have to do. He did. Um, this is a guy who works regularly and he shaved his head for the part like that's dedication and I don't know how old Mark is um, but I, I I could I could guess by looking at him that he's 30 but he's probably 50 I don't know because when he showed up to the rehearsal and we were rehearsing our fight scene he still fights like he did 20 years ago he is exactly he still does a butterfly twist he can still kick almost vertically he was amazing, and he had a really good memory, and he was super cool. And when I when I went up to him with like ten DVDs, because I knew he was going to be there, so I brought all all of my all of my Mark Costco's DVDs. I'm such a fanboy. I brought all my Mark Costco's DVDs. I was like, will you sign these? He's like, oh man, that's so cool. That guy's cool. He, was, <laughs> he would kind of um, he would kind of keep away from the crew though while we were shooting, like like until his part. Uh, he would, uh, he was just kind of getting into it and, um, and he would sort of just go off and I would, I would always, you know, look at, where's my idol, where's Mark? And I, and I would see him like way the hell off in the distance, like on a hill, kind of like meditating, but he's got the script in front of him because that's what he's doing. He's reading the script and kind of like getting into it because he had a lot of lines too. And, uh, we wouldn't bug him of course, but again, a professional and it showed <laughs> kind of made me feel like, ah, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm nothing compared to this guy. <laughs> I love that guy. All right, my next question is coming from Chad Opiz. Um, do you have any particular favorite style of martial arts to showcase and chore and choreography? Uh, Chad, my music friend. My favorite kind of hmm, that's a tough one is when I choreograph, and for the for the viewers that don't know, I when I do when I make my own movies, which is kind of how I 
become known is by making my own martial art movies and feature films. Um, and I tend to choreograph all of the fights in these movies. Uh, my favorite, my favorite kind of choreography really is just basic kickboxing and distancing. Um, and I think that you can do so much with boxing and kicking um, and just playing with distances, playing with timing and just tweaking performances. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think that has a, has kind of like a, a baseline for choreographers. I think when choreographers can master how to choreograph boxing and kickboxing, then they can move on to like the weird esoteric stuff like Eagle Claw or whatever, or kind of experiment. And there are a lot of things that you can, a lot of fun you can have with like Arnis, for example. And I had a lot of fun doing Kali in uh, Death Grip, which is a knife based fighting system that's meant to just kind of stab and kill within three moves. Um, so, uh, so my answer is twofold. One, I would say that when it comes to just the, the basics, the first thing I go to is, is like kickboxing and boxing. Um, I choreograph those and then to spice it up because those two things are very accessible to most people. When you start kind of doing like Eagle Claw and Wing Chun and stuff, like pe most people don't really get it. Um, it's only when you can master those basic fighting styles that you can go into the crazier stuff. But I would say then, the, if I can make that leap, I would say Kali would be my next favorite. All right. My next question is from Fantastic Ninja uh, to Eric. You created so many beautiful action scenes. How do you stay fresh for your ideas? Uh, I, so one of the things that I, I always do when I'm choreographing is I choreograph on location. I don't like to choreograph in a gym. That tends to be how a lot of fights are choreographed. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, some people are actually very good at just coming up with choreography in a gym. Like Larnell can be anywhere. Um, he could be in a concrete laden parking lot and he can come up with brand new ideas and create an entire fight scene. He may even shoot the thing just to have it kind of like in his repository. Um, I need to be there on location. And that's when I get my inspiration and I can then, you know, choreograph and take it back to the gym and rehearse it to have to, you know, to drill it and get it, get it right. So that when we actually have to shoot, we can shoot it in a short amount of time. Um, but the way that we typically do it is, I mean, we, like I, you know, me and the cameraman and the crew and the actors, we'll get to the location and I'll look around and I'll say, what do we got? We got this wall here. We got this kind of thing here. We should, I plot out the story. We should go from here to there. And, uh, and that's when I get my best ideas is like right there on the spot. And I work well under pressure. So as long as there's continual pressure down on me, I can stay creative. Uh, now, I, gotta, I see people mentioning something here, and I've actually been asked about this before. Uh, do we expect to see Strikers Roundhouse Kick in the MK Legacy series? Uh, do you know I what kick I'm talking about, right? I think I can say that I unfortunately do not get to do that roundhouse kick. <laughs> I think I can give that away. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves sure. that roundhouse kick, man. That's like one of the most powerful kicks in the game. Uh, I know, I know. <clears throat> All right. There's just you know it's 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 tough to get everything in, because um, as as a fan too, I would have loved to see every X-ray. You know, I would have loved to see every special move and the fatalities, and you know, it was a low budget shoot. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of money. There wasn't a whole lot of time. Um, you have a lot of people too. I mean, getting like Casper Van Dien and Mark DeCascos and, uh, me <laughs> all together at the same place at once and like a crew of 80 something people. It's tough. And like we're shooting in daylight, you know, and just to get, just to get people a con some context of like how difficult it is to just get everything in there in a, in a perfect world. We would have done everything. Um, well, hopefully for the movie, you guys can get everything that you didn't get accomplished in there. That's you know that's that's the dream. You know. All right, my next question is for Carid. Uh, have you ever played Mortal Kombat in the arcades competitively? Never played competitively. I was too afraid. <laughs> Honestly, uh, the only guy that I think that I could have that when I would play. UMK3, um, I could play with Smoke pretty well. 
I, I didn't have a good streak, but I think I was over 50 50 with smoke. Um, I liked him, but no, <laughs> God, no. All right. My next one is from a uh, house of Klegon. Um, <laughs> who are you? Who are who are you most excited to work with when you found out who was going to be in the cast of Mortal Kombat Legacy? Uh, Mark Dacascos, definitely. <laughs> Mark Dacascos, number one, and uh, frankly, um, Larnell Stovall, number two, because um, nothing against Larnell, like you're great, you know. But uh, no, like because because Larnell, when he when he choreographs, you know you're in good hands. I mean, especially having seen, you know, Undisputed 2 and 3, it's like, well, this guy can pinpoint exactly what my skills are and then bring those out. Um, and, uh, he's extremely good at thinking on his, th on his feet, too. Like, there were times when we would have the entire scene choreographed and, uh, and we would have drilled it 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. And, uh, and somebody would come in and they'd say, well... There's a problem. Like we're only going to be able to do this over here, and we can't do the sliding thing. We have to change this part. And to a choreographer, that's like throwing a wrench in the machine. Like you just really have to reset everything. And you just kind of go, okay, give me a minute, give me a minute. And he kind of walk around, and he's like, he kind of like, you know, shadow box the moves a little bit, and then he'd come back and say, all right, here's what we're going to do. And he had it like within five minutes. That guy's really good, and there's a reason he's getting a lot of work with him. Um, I was so happy to work with him. I knew I was in good hands. All right, from some uh, some Cuban, no, some guy eight. Are you surprised how big video game business has gotten in the last decade? I am, very. I didn't think that it would get beyond the nerdy homebrew thing. Um, it's so big now that you don't just have one kind of video game anymore. Um, I am sad, by the way, that arcades are gone. Uh, it, it's basically a thing in the past, and. I loved arcade culture. I loved the, that. I loved knowing that every mall that I went to had an arcade. That's gone. That was gone by the year 2000, I think. But um, but what did change is the home video, the home video market really exploded, and all of those kids that loved video games grew up, took C++ classes, took Java classes. Now they can write video games. And they're a force to be reckoned with because while you have like the mega companies making the 60, 70 million dollar games, you have these tiny, like three to eight employee companies that are making these awesome video games. And frankly, I don't play the big budget games anymore. I just don't bother. I don't play, I don't play Call of Duty. It's a, it's an awesome game. I just don't have like the time or the effort to put into it. I, I go for, the, like PlayStation Network has fifteen dollar games and five dollar games that are so good to me. Like they're they are better than the blockbuster games from when I was a kid, and they're made by teams of you know three to eight people, and they cost almost nothing. Um, I'm shocked that, I, and I think that those people are making a lot of money right now. I hope they are. I don't look at sales figures too much for those video games. That maybe you guys can confirm, um, but I think that those games do really well, especially in they they know exactly what gamers want. It's like they read they read forums, you know, they read blog comments. Like the feedback loop is really good for these guys. And they can just they can release a patch to fix an annoying uh, glitch of some kind or some kind of thing that's just bugging all the gamers. Um, I think that that kind of thing can only happen when a market is so exploding, explosive the way that it is right now. Uh, it's like films, too. Filmmaking is very much the same. It's just video games have, have accelerated at five times the rate because, you know, they're not, not very new. They, they only really, video games only really started in, in the late 70s. Um, and uh, it shocked me because the cool kids are in now. Hmm. All right. Uh, my next question is, from some guy eight, will you be sporting a beard during the new MK series? This beard is left over from about. See, I, sh I finished shooting about a month ago, so this minus a month. There's a little bit of beard there. It's pretty scruffy, but it's not a. 
it's not beard level like this. Like I can hide, <laughs> like I can hide my mouth. In this thing. <laughs> did you did you uh, did you see the the rebirth striker? No, I haven't seen that yet. Is that the new thing? That just well, came no. Out? In, in rebirth, striker was actually in it. And and a lot of people don't know it. He was the cop that was setting up to mm -hmm. invade, uh, and not that in uh, in in Legacy, uh, the Kano Jacks edition. Oh, he was in the Legacy? cop. Yeah, he was the cop that was that was telling him not to go after Sonya at first. Yeah, it was a uh, Tamo Pink Pinkett, right? I the believe, other guy. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean that just goes to show that they. They change actors season to season. Um, I mean, I was lucky to get on. Uh, that guy's, a, from what I understand, he's an accomplished actor. Uh, I'm honored to be in there, you know, and I hope that I can stay. Um, well, I mean, uh, I mean, I personally think you make a a a, a, a great look for for Striker. Uh, um, you know, uh, let's see how you work with those gadgets. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, as long as the fans who, you know, look for that true to role, you know, and, and, and look and feel, you don't have to look like John Cena, you know, like the MK9 version. Uh, but if you play the role and fit the role, trust me, the, the Mortal Kombat community is very vocal. Yeah. Um, especially after disaster that was called Mortal Kombat 2, the movie, Annihilation. Yeah. You know, so they've gotten very vocal since then and, you know, people taking notice of it. So um, yeah. I definitely uh, I definitely think, uh, or should I say I could speak for myself and most of the players that I know, you'll do all right. Thank you. You, you, got, you definitely it. got that good look. Thank you. I'm also uh, really... Uh, when I, I remember when season one came out, and I was expecting, I mean, there were some episodes that didn't even have fighting, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. And, and even those, the fans liked them because, and this is this is kind of a, um, this is sort of what you're dealing with when you come to these when you get to these fans. And these fans aren't just looking for rock'em sock'em action and nothing behind it. These guys, these people, the, the Mortal Kombat fans, they want character. And that says a lot about that community. Um, because even I was like, well, if there's no fighting, what, what's going on? And then I'll read comments and they would make great points that, oh, yeah, I like what he did with the Raiden character. Like he took it in this direction. And that's kind of interesting given his backstory. And I was like, wow, this is a very dedicated, intelligent community. Like these people appreciate character. Yeah, they definitely, yeah. I mean, Raiden was definitely a, I mean, even for myself, he was kind of a, a shock, if you will. No pun yeah. intended on that. But, uh, you know, and surprisingly, I wound up going back and watching the episode two or three times. And I said, you know what? I really liked what he did. You know, the, the concept that he came up with him was, you know, I didn't need to see him beating up, you know, somebody in a Mortal Kombat tournament. He kind of, you know, he kind of remind of, of just somebody that kind of wrong place at the wrong time, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was really sort of, I was pleased to see that too. That people, uh, that people appreciate the characters uh, over the, you know, whatever it might be. They, they, they appreciate character before anything else. And really, that's that's the bottom line when it comes to any kind of genre of film, which is that you can't have action sci-fi horror without the character without the story and mortal kombat fans they just love that stuff they, they eat it up and i think i think they're going to be really happy with season two um you know that they're they're that's a good audience you guys are cool <laughs> you know one of the things that you know and it wasn't a negative as much as it was a budget issue the shortness you know, the shortness of Legacy 1, that it left you hanging in that spot. I mean, I'm always cool with cliffhangers, but, it, you know, it, it yeah. would leave you in this spot where you were like, you knew that, you know, like with the Scorpion Sub-Zero, they threw you a bone and gave you the second part. But some of them, they just cut them right to like the Cyrax, you know, the final one. It just like ended them right there and you were like, 
they're just looking at you, man. You can't end it with them just looking at me. They got to go kill somebody. Yeah, it is. It's so tough right? doing these, doing you know, ten episodes on such a low budget. And you know, what they're talking about is like, I can't remember what exactly the budget was, but it was small. And when I walked on set, I couldn't believe that there were ninety to a hundred people working on this thing every day for the budget that I, they're working on. And you know, with that comes certain limitations. Um, you can't get everything all the time, and uh, you make do. You know what can I say? Um, that's just the nature of doing these web series. You know. I guess uh, free food the real. <laughs> I I remember I did some acting back in the day, college stuff, and they were like, oh, "I give you free food and the real." I'm like, "Really?" Credit. <laughs> and, and then beat me. Exactly. And sometimes they'd be like, I'll give you producer credit, too. I was like, ooh, thanks. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with all that. Natus, you got some more questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, from some guy 8 what advice do you have for, some, for anyone trying to get into Korea in Hollywood? Oh, great question. Um, so I start this with the obligatory, well, I did this, or should I do that? You know, Whatever way you want. Okay. Um, I would, um, I would preface this by saying that I did not do it a conventional way. Uh, I went about in a very around, roundabout way, um, because I started just making my own films and my goal was to my goal from the beginning was to literally be in a role like striker where, you know, I was acting and I was fighting and I was doing an acting action part. Like, I don't know what you call that still like an action hero, I guess you would say, you know, like, I always loved Arnold Schwarzenegger. I loved Bruce Willis. Willis. I loved Jackie Chan. I loved Buster Keaton. I wanted to do that. And I didn't want to just do stunts. Um, it was a very clear, path if you want to do just stunts and i don't need to really talk about how to go about doing that because it's very well laid out you basically pick a, a skill that you have and you be the best at it um if you're not the best at it then you pick another one and you become the best at that when it comes to doing acting and and i assume that's what they ask what the uh, what the person who's asking the question is wondering about is how to become an actor who does action or even just acts. And the important thing now um, that we're in a YouTube generation is to just do a lot of work yourself um, and do as much of your own work that you can um, do the best that you can find your angle. My angle was sort of the American underdog who could fight if he had to, um, and I could crash on the ground, I could fall I'm pretty good at that. And that was kind of my angle. Um, there weren't many guys doing that back when I started. And whatever your angle is, if it's comedy, uh, if it's do, if you have a very serious demeanor about you, if you have something unique about you too, hell, get a camera and shoot it. You know, find a guy who can shoot it well. Even uh, pay a guy a little bit. A little money goes a long way. Uh, that that should be noted for anybody who's looking to get in on this YouTube thing, <laughs> because um, you know a little bit of money can take you from a thousand views to a hundred thousand views. A hundred thousand views is a lot because a lot of people, see that. Um, and especially when you send that to important people that you've met. Um, what I did, for example, you know and. Let me, let me say, too, that this is 12 years of work that I've done in order to get this striker role. It was 12 years of, you know, shooting all the time, making a lot of movies, using a lot of my own money. I spent 45000 of my life savings doing a film called Death Grip, which is now on DVD. Um, and it stars me uh, doing really cool fight scenes. And I sent that... I, I had a little fight scene from that, a knife fight that I did with Alvin Singh. And I sent that around to various stunt coordinators and fight choreographers that I had met. 
uh, along along the way. And I sent that little fight to them. And that got me in on a lot of different things. And it was just, it, 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 again, it was like, it was a matter of just doing a lot of work. <laughs> I think it's just, that's what it's been all about the whole time. I can't stress that enough. Um, you got to make, you got to go out there and make stuff. Um, if, if you can't, do, and you're going to have to do everything. You're going to have to write it. You're going to have to direct it. You're going to have to produce it. You're going to have to make all the phone calls. You're going to have to do all the annoying things where you have to get your friend out of bed because he, he sucks. He doesn't want to shoot it, but you have to make him shoot it. You have to buy all the food. You have to make everybody happy. You're going to have to take the thing on your computer and edit it too. I mean, it's just a lot of work. Um, unless you make it, unless you're lucky, but you just can't depend on luck. Um, luck doesn't sweat. Uh, you just got to kind of do it all. And mm -hmm. That should be motivation for anybody who has a good work ethic, uh, because that's that is really the key to success. It's just like ninety nine percent. Let me let me ask you. Uh, obviously, now you know knowing a bit of your background, uh, digital or film? What do you prefer? You mean working with or viewing? Yeah. Either well, obviously digital for viewing. I would think. Yeah. I mean, I've only I've only worked with film once or twice. I did a 16 millimeter short in film school, and I was the only guy, probably in the history of that cinema class, to do a martial art movie on 16 millimeter. Um, and even my teacher was like, I, I I gave before I did the shoot. You know, we all had to draw up a, a shot list, and uh, and I said 16 millimeter, no problem, 45 shots, 45 shots in three hours. <laughs> I can do that. And I gave her the list. And she looked at it and she was just like, you can't do that. You can't make, you can't do 45 shots in three hours. I said, yes, I can. I've done this before. She's like, no, cut it down to 20 shots. I can't, I can't make a martial art movie in 20 shots. Are you kidding me? So I went in and I did 45 shots anyway. It only took me two hours. <laughs> Hard work. I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, that was the only time I did uh, 16 millimeter though. All the other times have been digital. Uh, I would love to shoot 35 millimeter, but like, the costs of it are just so high. I, mean, I actually got to shoot with Super 16, and I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing looking. Uh, there's something, even having shot, you know, films three or four years on digital before making that 16 millimeter film. When you like see yourself projected in 60, 16 millimeter, you're kind of like, wow, that's a movie. Like there's some kind of legitimacy to it, you know. But that was back in 2004. Now, all of, I mean, you can buy a crappy little camera this big and it'll shoot film that looks almost exactly the same as 35 millimeter um, to, to, the, to the average human being anyway. Um, there's really, for better or for worse, there's no reason to go 35 millimeter anymore. I mean, some of these formats are higher resolution than 35 millimeter. There's like 8,000 vertical lines or 8,000 horizontal lines now. Um, it, it'll just keep get, it'll just keep going in that direction. Um, I'm sad that film is gone. I think that it has this unique feel, feel, and I love that. I would love to do that someday. I know, like some people do it on purpose sometimes, and sometimes they'll shoot a 16 millimeter film on purpose, like uh, City of Violence, the Korean film. They shot that in 16 millimeter, and they could have shot it in digital, but they took they chose 16 millimeter anyway. Um, but just in terms of overall accessibility and pricing, yeah, go for go for digital. Natus. All right. Um, next question from same another guy. Some guy ate again. Uh, if you've seen any of them, what is your favorite comic book animated movie? Comic book animated movie, like like an animated movie based on comic book. Like you know, like the Batman ones they made, Superman, Justice League, uh, Hulk, Marvel, Wolverine. Um, I have to admit, I haven't seen many. I, I used to watch the Ninja Turtles show as a kid. <laughs> That's about it. No. Damn. Um, I would watch the Batman show too when I was thirteen. That was a good show. That was when it was really good in like the, the early nineties, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I love that show. I still watch. I still watch that show now. Hey, Natus, was that Kevin Conroy then? Yes, it was. Okay. And same thing with uh, Matt Hamill. Mark Hamill. 
Uh, Mark Hamill, uh, sorry. Would be uh, the joke. Yeah, correct. He did Joker. We're actually trying to reach out to both of those guys to try to get them on the show in the future because they also awesome. do the voices for the new Injustice game by Never Realm Studios. That'd be awesome. Um, next question from some guy eight. Um, who will win in a fight between Chupacabra and Burst of Predator? Both have no gear or weapons. Chupacabra and what? And the Predator. And they both have no weapons and, and no gear. No weapons. Well, Chupacabra never has weapons. <laughs> That's what I, I thought the same thing to myself when I read that question. Yeah, I, remember, like, I remember Chupacabra with weapons, man. That'd be kind of funky. <laughs> yeah, we throw, throw goats and pull off tree limbs and hit get Chupacabra by, by a long shot. I would bet 10 to 1 on Chupacabra. <laughs> <laughs> Put my money on that guy. All right, my next question from uh, Mike Metroid. Uh, Eric, would you ever play as Billy Mays in a movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Billy Mays, the musical, or Billy Mays, the action film. Oh, man. That'd be a dream come true. I'd love to. I could sell the shit out of anything. <laughs> Good question. Yes. <laughs> Write the script and I'll do it. Uh, from Jordan Fountain. Um, do you have any advice for beginning fighting choreographers? Um, yeah, um, my advice is um, a little bit. So the way that I when I choreograph, I don't I don't just go to a gym and kind of figure out what moves would be cool. Um, what I do is every shot of the fight, like when you watch an action movie. It goes shot by shot by shot by shot by shot. And there's like a bit of action here, and then it cuts to another angle, it cuts to another angle, it cuts to another angle. <laughs> the way that we typically do that is every one of those shots is carefully uh, designed for that camera angle. And every time that I'm coming up with choreography, I'm imagining the camera angle, like how the action looks from that camera angle. So that's kind of like my way of looking at how a fight scene comes together. And um, what typically happens in Hollywood is that you have the choreographer come up with the whole fight. And, uh, you know, it could be a, a minute, minute long, two minute long fight. And then a cameraman will come in and shoot it from a bunch of different angles. And then the editor will cut it all up. Um, that's not really how we do it. Uh, that's not how the Hong Kong guys did it. That's not how I do it either. Um, and frankly, that's not how Mortal Kombat did it either, because Larnell had, Larnell Stovall, the choreographer, had the angle kind of in mind as he was choreographing. He's like, well, we're going to shoot this one here. We're going to do a master on this shot. This one's OTS. We're going to get a close up on the actor here so we can show off that he's actually doing some stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's rare. Um, my understanding is that often the choreographer doesn't really have much say over where the camera is going to be. Uh, if he does, he's quite lucky. Or he's, you know, he and the director are working closely enough together so that he can, they can convince the camera to, to be in certain places. All but right. the, the way that I choreograph is I choreograph by the angle. If I, you know, the, the angle is over this guy's shoulder, well, only these certain moves look good from this angle. Um, that drives a lot of my choreography is where the camera is going to be placed. I tend to pick... I tend to decide on the story first. As a choreographer, I decide on the story of the fight, which is just like the story of a movie. You know, you have the, the beginning and the ending images. You have the half, the midway point. Uh, you have things kind of get bad after the midway point and things get good. You have the finale. And then you decide on the path and you decide on the angles for that fight. And you pick the stuff that looks the best for those angles. And that's a lot of back and forth with the cameraman. Um, and uh, and make it look good for the camera. It's a lot of it's a lot of trial and error, making a fight look good for a camera. Because you could throw a punch super fast every time, but from some angles it just will look like crap, and you can't you just can't get around that unless you experiment and figure out what looks good from what angles. Like a like a WWE going and seeing it live for the first time and going wow. It looked so good on TV. <laughs> <clears throat> Edit that thing, didn't they? 
They knew to go down low for when the guy jumped off the ropes. But when you're up high looking at that guy, it just doesn't look anymore for something. Until they went ridiculous and started doing things like throwing mankind off the top of rings. And I went, wow, now this shit's real, real. Yeah. yeah that's when they just gave up on the, on the, the fake part. <laughs> All right. Um, next one's not a, it's not a question. It's a comment from one of our users. Um, this is from Napalm88. Um, your beard is epic, epic as hell. 16 rigs should take notes. Who should? 16 rigs should take notes. We have a player in our community that uh, sports the beard. Uh, but he's kind of, not to uh, pick on him, but it kind of looks like a bird's nest. Uh, <laughs> he's got to kind of groom that shit down a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great comment. And when I was in sixth grade, my dad bought me a shaver. And he was like, "You better start early, kid." <laughs> Shit, I wouldn't be able. To grow, I, I wouldn't be able to grow that in fifty years. And this is a month. Damn, I can't even grow it. That's all. This is me after two months, and this is what I have. All right. Thank uh, you. I get a lot of good words from people about this. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my next question from some guy: eight. How much money did you lose combined in the Simpsons arcade and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade? Okay, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade. I spent. I think I spent fifteen bucks trying to beat that game one time. Just <laughs> Damn! Beating stupid, beating stupid Bebop. But Rocksteady was the one that was a pain in the butt. The machine gun, right? Yeah. God damn that! It was just. Oh, we had it at uh, Viking Sea Country. We had that game. I just pumped like 15 bucks in it. I was young. I was stupid and like, whatever. Like, I wanted to beat the game, but man, I was alone too, so I didn't have any buddies to help me out. Yeah, that sucks when you got to do that alone. That's not a game that you can really get through alone. Uh -oh. uh, Simpsons was, I think that one was even harder. I don't think I ever made it. I, oh, the last guy was that googly arm guy, right? Uh, I, I can't remember. Yes, I do believe. If I remember, it, it is the uh, I forgot what they call them. Those inflatable, those inflatable advertisement things. But yeah, yeah, they had on Family Guy. Yeah, that guy. Uh oh, you watch Family I, Guy, I, huh? Yeah, a little bit. I didn't favorite make episode. Through. Favorite episode, of Family Guy. The uh, the one with the fight with the chicken on the. On the uh, they go everywhere. One with the chicken. Yeah, they're up to. Uh, I think they're up to the third, third, third continuation of that fight now. <laughs> really, I haven't watched. They wound up. Uh, I remember they wound up. I remember showing an episode. They wound up being friends at the end, and the chicken asked to take Peter out for dinner. And then when the bill came, Peter's like, "No, let me get it." <laughs> and he says, "No, <laughs> let me get it." And they wound up, and then they started the whole fight all over again over the check. <laughs> Good. I need to catch up with the guy. I've been bad. Well, actually, not catching up is good. That means you're working. That's true. I haven't caught up on anything. I don't catch up on. I mean, I, I, as a gamer, I have failed the community. Uh, I haven't played much at all. I, I get I get some stuff off of PlayStation Network, but I have PlayStation Plus, so I get free stuff. And I tend to just, you know, I get those and then. I buy some other stuff too. Like I'll buy the old arcade games too. Like Fighting Vipers just came out, which I was really happy about. Those were one of my favorites. Wow, Fighting Vipers. Yeah. That was a great yeah. game. Yeah. And when it came out on Saturn, the backgrounds weren't 3D. It was like just 2D backgrounds, you know? And so now it's all in 3D. And I was like, oh, what about that? Five bucks. Five bucks well spent. All right. Um, I got another question here. This is from Rio. Uh, what female MK character would you do and why? Please go into details if possible. Uh, which one would I do? <laughs> Gotta love Rio. Come on, Shiva with the forearms. No, but Shiva's like... She's kind of... that. She's like the lawyer. The lost of the MK girls. Who's like really... God, why am I saying <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's last call ball. She's a complete bitch. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't stick. I wouldn't. I wouldn't let her stay over. She would not have bacon and eggs the next morning. Yeah. Um. But uh, <laughs> my career is over. Um. 
<laughs> the uh, now can I even answer it? <laughs> which one? Which of the women had the teeth thing? Not Melina. Her. Melina. Melina has the teeth. So Katana is the nicer looking one. All right, I thought you were gonna roll with Melina. I was gonna be like, "Yo, I give you mad props on that." <laughs> All right, sorry, right, not me. <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> oh my god! All right, I got another question now from Fantastic Ninja. Um, you're a fight choreographer yourself. How do you, how do you adjust taking directions from another choreographer? Any disagreements? I I love taking direction from other people because um, it's a big burden off my off my shoulders. Frankly, uh, choreographing myself is really tough uh, because I often, you know, I'm the one on camera and I choreograph myself and then I kind of have to imagine what I look like from that camera angle right now. Um, and I have to like go back to the camera and check it. Putting that in somebody's else, somebody else's hands, I love it. And I knew, like I said, Larnell is extremely good. I knew I was in good hands. Um, you, you know, I, I would come up with some ideas and you would take them. Um, but often I just, I don't know, I, I didn't need to. The guy did undisputed, you know, why would I need to give any input? All right, Cheech 2 is asked, he knows you've done some movies with, with different accents. He says, you have a Chinese accent that you do. <laughs> Am I supposed to give you a Chinese accent right now? Is that what's happening? That's what he's asking. <laughs> okay. A little bit of background. I, I understand and I speak Cantonese fairly well. Um, I took it. I learned it for three and a half years. I, I was immersed in it. Um, that being said, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to imitate Hong Kong people. In their like, <laughs> in their like English form, um, because Hong Kong people speak the best English of any Asian country that I've that I've known. Um, but oh my God, do they know how to make an accent? Well, like that's the Hong Kong accent. I mean. You got it, Cheech. <laughs> there you go. It's done. <laughs> all right, to, to all the viewers out. I'm sorry. Uh, to all the viewers out there, if you have any questions, please submit them to our uh, Twitter account, On Blast Show, or on Facebook, The On Blast Show. Uh, I'm going through all the questions, so as soon as you guys get them to me, I will get I will get them out there. So remember, guys, please send them to us. I keep putting the link out there for you guys. I have still a bunch of more questions, but guys, keep sending the questions out there. Um, Natus, is that it? You tell her you backed no, up on questions. No, 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 no. I still got more, but I'm oh, just, I'm just say. letting people know. I just, sometimes you got to vote. I can't, like I said, tonight. Unfortunately, I can't do that 4 a.m. jammy. So, I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to keep him all night. But we're gonna keep him until he says he wants to go. <laughs> all right. Um, my next question is from Jordan Fountain again. Uh, do you feel like you have changed your martial arts? So it looks better on camera. If so, how? Yeah, there are um, there are a lot of moves that don't look good from certain angles, and I mean that's as that's as simple as it gets right there. Um, so I I know that sometimes martial artists have a tendency to kind of like like kind of like get small because that's proper martial arts. A lot of the time is to get as small as possible, duck your chin. And keep your keep everything tight like this. Um, that doesn't look very good on camera. You kind of have to get bigger. You gotta have to hold your hands out here instead, rather than doing this stuff. The camera likes big, and you know I got into martial arts really because I wanted to look good on camera. I didn't get into martial arts to defend myself. That was never a problem. Um, I could, yeah, I was stronger than most of the kids in class, so it didn't matter. I was never picked on in that sense. Um, but, uh, so when I approach martial arts with that mentality, yes, I wanted to do martial arts properly. I wanted to actually do some service to the martial arts and, you know, if a martial artist saw me on camera, they could say, okay, yeah, that's the real stuff. Um, and at least then if I need to modify it, if I need to go from this to this, at least I can show something 
that rings true for martial artists. Um, but in the end, yes, I definitely did change how I, um, how I hold myself, uh, how I, uh, how I hold my hands and the way that I kick. Um, there are certain kicks. There, there are a lot of kicks really that just don't look very good on camera. Um, the kicks that I find that look the best are the half keto kicks because half keto kicks are very circular. Um, they're very strong. They, they're mostly, they're mostly coming from the hip. They're not, um, they're not like Krav Maga kicks. They're not practical kicks. They're not kicks to the knee. They're not nut kicks. Uh, that stuff doesn't look very good on camera. I wouldn't do that stuff. Um, there are some people that can make Krav Maga look good, but I think in and of itself, it, it tends not to be the, the style of choice. Uh, you always have to modify it quite a bit. So long, long answer short. Yes. Did you, uh, have, did you uh, compete as far as the martial arts go or did you just take it for own personal gain? Just myself. I've never been in a fight in my life. Really? Never been in a fight in my life. I've always been able to talk my way out of it um, or run really fast. Fast <laughs> run. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, growing up, like, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming growing up you were a quiet kid, jock, burnout. I was a quiet kid. I was the gamer, and I didn't have any siblings, so I spent my time playing video games and doing gymnastics. And yeah, I was the quiet kid in the school. And yeah, there are the there are the the bullies, and they would pick on me just verbally, um, but they would never get near me because I started weightlifting when I was in seventh grade. And they just, you know, as soon as they didn't stand a chance if they came within striking distance of me, but it just never happened. They would just, they would just make fun of me from across the room, and I, I didn't have any good comebacks. I wasn't very witty. Uh, so that's, you know, weightlifting was kind of my thing. And and that's why also I, 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 um, I associate myself with the underdog. You know, I kind of understand the mentality, the vulnerability, the, the clown in a sense. And I can pull those emotions out more easily than the badass, than the bully, than the jock. I don't have really, I don't have those emotions ready to pull from me. I have to kind of work at those. Um, which again, why? Striker was such a good part for me. Now I know you said, you know, I, I know I can't get you to talk about uh, MK at all, but uh, what about Marine Corps? Marine Corps, what would you like to know about Marine Corps? Uh, well, who's Kurt Hammer? <laughs> <laughs> that is me. What's the, uh, I mean, what, what uh, can you talk a little bit about as far as the story? I mean, I don't want you to get, like, too, like, like, yeah. the... No, it's, the story's awesome. Uh, it's written by Steve Carolan, and he's, he's over in England, and he's working on the script as, I, as we speak, and, uh, um, uh, or he's getting drunk, one or the other. He, so the story is about Kurt Hammer. He is a, he's a Marine. He's kind of down and out. He's homeless right now, dishonorably discharged and wandering the streets kind of fallen in a rut uh, after the iraq war and his commander from the war pulls him up out of the gutter and says i'm gonna set you back on track i'm gonna take you on a uh i'm gonna get you back with the old team uh gonna bring you back to life basically and uh, i've got one of your old war buddies from from the from the battalion too uh, and uh and you know come out to this retreat out in the woods and you know, meet up with your old crew so he takes him out there. Kurt goes out to there, out to the uh, out to the woods with uh, with his commander. Tank Man is the commander's name. And next thing Kurt knows is that he is actually the subject of a manhunt. And what Tank Man has done is set him up in a sort of surviving the game type premise. He set Kurt on the run, and these six guys that have all paid into this game are hunting. The one that catches Kurt first wins the whole pot. So they basically, it's it, it's it's a setup, pretty much. 
So, uh, so in that, is there uh, martial arts or is it more of, of you know, survival, quote unquote, let's say striker gadget, you know, you know, gadget guns type of. There are no weapons allowed, no uh, firearms allowed during the fight, during the, uh, the hunt. So it's all hand to hand weapons, um, no, um, no ammunition. That sounds so they're cool. weapons, guns, yeah. So a lot of martial arts. We've got some cool ideas for it. I don't want to give too much away, yeah. but uh, and there's a lot. Of and that's this action. year, right? That's this year. Any uh, close to a release date, or or you know, end of first quarter, end of third quarter. We would like we would like to shoot this in, um, in the summer, and then release it soon after. We'll see these things. Uh, we're, we're pretty quick. Our process is quick now. When we did Death Grip, you know, we shot it in, uh, we shot it in, let's see, 2011, shot it in like, you know, September of 2011, and we released it just, you know, seven months later. So we're good at doing this stuff now. We can release quick. Now, were you involved in the editing process for that, or is it, uh, are, are you just, that, so you're involved all around pretty much? All around helping develop the script. I'm not writing this. I mean, I wrote Death the previous film that I did. Um, and uh, much as I love writing, it's, it's, it was, it's not exactly what I want to do. And when I met Steve, um, the guy just had great ideas. And he really understood story structure and character development and catharsis in general. Um, you know, the need for characters to change. And he's just kind of the right guy. And I said, well, what about, let's, let's create something new. And uh, came up with Marine Corps. Um, so I won't be writing it this time, but I, I probably will be editing it. Um, and, yeah, I've edited